Um, a number of us went to Myanmar uh, recently uh, with CSIS. Steve and I, uh, Emerald Collison, uh, Lindsay, uh, Murray Hebert, uh, and we were really trying to take a look at how the broader recommendations of CSIS on the Lower Mekong Initiative and its relationship to health bore on the particular issues relative to Myanmar. So I hope uh, in the next section we're going to be able to talk a little bit more specifically around some of the challenges that exist in Myanmar and maybe some of the ways that the recommendations that came out in the earlier sessions uh, could take hold there. Uh, my name is Todd Summers. I work at CSIS. Uh, I also spend a lot of time with the Global Fund. I chair a commission uh, or committee of the board that focuses on strategy. Uh, the Global Fund is a major investor in the region uh, and as has been said before, we just announced a $100 million uh, a regional initiative to address Artemis and resistant malaria. We also have several hundred million dollars invested uh, in Myanmar. So uh, it is an institution that is providing a substantial amount of resources to the area. Uh, our panel today, uh, we have a great panel. Uh, we've asked them to be very sharp and quick so we can get quickly to questions. I know this is a time where the post-lunch narcolepsy uh, kicks in. So we're going to try to be a little bit fast-paced here and edgy. Hope that works. Uh, Mukesh. I'm from the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank is, uh, has a relatively light presence at, uh, in Myanmar, but is looking at a very substantial increase. They've just finished some studies to look at where the money is on health, uh, so maybe he can give us some late-breaking news on, on that analysis. But we're really going to understand what the World Bank is, is going to do with the billion dollars or so that it's talking about with, Milimer, uh, with Myanmar in terms of uh, IDA capacity. Uh, Katie from USAID. Uh, AID has got a, a, a small but important presence on health in the region that's an amazing group of people that are extremely impressive. We were all uh, warmed by the uh, quality of the people there and their commitment, but also daunted by the task that, uh, that's ahead of them uh, and the country. Um, uh, we have um, Patricia, obviously from CDC, spoke at an earlier panel. CDC's uh, in the region and now has some people in country and is uh, complementing what USAID is doing on health. And that Miat, who's here, I have to say, in his personal capacity, uh, even though uh, on other days he happens to work for the U.S. government uh, with the National Institutes of Health. But he is here on his own, uh, on a vacation day, officially. So, Mukesh, let's start with you. Uh, the World Bank, uh, we've been very excited that uh, Dr. Jim Kim came in, uh, long history of work on health, a famous HIV AIDS doctor. Uh, waiting a little bit for some of the money to move on health. You're looking at Myanmar, uh, I think you said in the past, maybe a billion dollars of IDA credit uh, coming to them. Health could be a key part of that. What's the World Bank's view on Myanmar? and What are you thinking about going forward? Thank you, thank you, Todd. So a few months back when we were in Myanmar, we had a conversation with the Minister of Health and we asked him, we said, what do you think, Mr. Minister, what do you think is, is the one big problem of health in Myanmar? And he thought for a little bit, looked up at the ceiling, and he said that uh, people in Myanmar die 18 years earlier than people in Japan. I want you to figure out a scheme for us, a mechanism for us, so that we can live 18 years more. So that was the vision. Now, that's how we all started doing the work in Myanmar. And then we found out that, OK, maybe Japan is too far away, Singapore is too far away, neighboring Thailand. There are 29,200 deaths annually in Myanmar, which occur due to preventable causes, which would not have occurred, or which would not occur, if they had health system outcomes the way that they have them in Thailand. There's 29,200 deaths, or 29,200 lives can be saved annually. So that was the inspiration of the work that when we started to see, okay, how much is the money, where is the money going, who's spending the money, who's consuming it, who's using it. And some of the results that we found were absolutely startling. So I'll just throw out some numbers here for your consumption. First, Myanmar today spends a total of 1.2 billion US dollars on health. Assuming the population is 60 million, give or take, that is $20 per person per year. That's, that's the amount of money that they spend on health. Second, most of the money, 65% or so, is in the private sector, is out-of-pocket payment. Government spending is about 30%. 5% comes from external sources. Third, in the last three years, to be very precise, between 2011-12 and 2012-13, government spending in Myanmar on health increased 
four times. In the last year, 2012-13, 2013-14, it increased one and a half times. In the last five years, it has increased nine times. The government is really very serious and pumping in a great deal of money in health. Most of this money is going into medicines. Medicines were not free a few years back. And people had to pay for it. Now, they're coming up with a policy, not fully developed there, but coming up with a policy to give medicines free to everybody. And a great deal of money is going into health infrastructure, into equipment, into buildings, into supplies. Where does this leave us? If there is any one country in that region that has a tremendous amount of potential to leapfrog and to, and to play catch up compared to where they were two, three years back, four years back, it is Myanmar. Tremendous opportunity. 60 million people, $20 per person per year on health. Jeffrey Sachs would put the number, the ideal number at closer to $40. So that is 2.4 billion. So they are still pretty much short at this point of time. They still need much, much, much more. But if they were to somehow magically discover the money to take care of their capital infrastructure of their equipment, if they were to magically discover the right policies for distribution of drugs, for distribution of health care, for delivery mechanisms, for the right kind of technology, for the right kind of people at the right kind of time, then this is one country that, to go back to what the minister had said to us when we started, can very rapidly close that gap. Life expectancy today is 65 years. Singapore, Japan is 83 years, it's 18 years. That's where they have to reach. And I think that goal is definitely attainable, very aspirational, lots and lots and lots of challenges, but to me, in the realm of possibility. Sorry. Great. Katie, uh, we met a great team over there, Bill Slater, uh, head of the health team, Tuvan, uh, really a very impressive, now there's a CDC person who showed up right after we left. Uh, but the challenges are really uh, almost uh, overwhelming. So they took us to visit one of the local health clinics uh, to see a program, we're right in the capital. We had to step over six inches of fetid water uh, to get to into the clinic where there was no power, no electricity. The bed uh, sheets looked like they hadn't been changed in quite a while. There was no IV tubes. We walked through a ward uh, that turned out afterwards to be the MDRTB ward. There was no protection for anybody in the ward. <coughs> uh, so uh, how are you looking at your engagement with, with Myanmar, and how does it fit within a lot of the dialogue around the grand scheme of LMI and your broader engagement with Myanmar? What, what is USAID doing on health? So from the beginning of, of this reopening in Myanmar, we've really been focused on recognizing that we're not coming in with this huge new mission and kind of taking over the donor landscape. So it's been really a big priority for us to work collaboratively with the other donors who are there and to listen to the Ministry of Health and what their priorities are to figure out what our strategic advantage can be. Um, one of the biggest things uh, that's been a priority for us and been really well received is that we're preparing to um, conduct the first ever DHS for Myanmar. And that will give us a lot of this data to figure out how, where do we direct programs to save those 29,000 lives? And what are the disparities? How how are health outcomes in the rural areas? We can assume they're much worse than even these urban clinics that you're going to. Um, but the DHS will really give us that data so that we can know where we are at. Um, and then we're also really prioritizing from the health system's perspective on working on the supply chain and helping the government of Myanmar to be able to manage their own supply chain. Um, we're launching the supply chain management systems activity and um, we want to help get the right policies and mechanisms in place for them to be able to get those, the equipment, the medicines out to where they need to go. Um, and also looking at the private sector, uh, there's a huge amount of care in the private sector and we don't quite know what, it, what does care look like when it's delivered in the private sector. Um, you know, how are the health outcomes different in the private sector versus the public sector and we want to help answer those questions. Great, thank you. Patty, uh, CDC, obviously, uh, we've talked a lot today about uh, artemisinin-resistant malaria. We have uh, drug-resistant TB in the area. We have a lot of HIV in the area. We have the potential for some of the other viruses that have been discussed. 
uh, moving in and out of the, uh, of the country. Uh, and we have a huge amount of people on the borders that are in very volatile situations and very mobile situations. So where is CDC seeing its role here? You have a, obviously a firmly established base in Bangkok. How are you looking to expand your role in Myanmar? Thank you. So um, I think that there's a, a, a lot of issues with the public health system has been brought up um, today in, in a number of ways, and that one of the biggest problems is um, that we, we don't have the information that's needed and that the government doesn't have the information that's needed for decision making. So I think that's a, um, an important role to help with surveillance and other, um, other data um, needs in the country. There's also public health security challenges like we talked about earlier that are important. We've just um, started our engagement there. We've, we've, we've worked in small ways for um, a number of years, but just recently, as you mentioned, um, uh, placed our first assignee there with the health team, with the USAID health team there. And um, we are uh, starting with our PEPFAR work. And we are, have been um, working on an ongoing basis with PMI and um, with um, USAID there as well. And, and um, the, the malaria resistance issues and the, and the issues on the border. We have um, uh, a lot of requests for technical assistance. In fact, um, any engagement we have either at scientific meetings or um, TDYs in the country, that they're um, even more than, than financial assistance, which I'm sure that financial assistance is needed, but is really for direct technical assistance. And this is the way that we've worked um, in a number of countries and it's a, um, been a successful model for us working side by side. Um, having um, full access to the technical expertise at CDC with our with our partners in country, so we we hope to do that more. Um, I, the challenge is in it's um, currently in in Burma. We haven't uh, been doing direct funding of, for the government, and um, we haven't um, uh, had a. Uh, what we usually do is have a cooperative agreement, a, 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 an agreement for. Um, working cooperatively on public health projects with some funding in the, in the country. So thinking about the transition of, of the government taking on uh, more of the di direct uh, role in the country and um, also thinking about their, the leadership that they will take with all of everybody who's trying to work there and how that's going to be coordinated is, re is really important moving forward. So Mia, you're looking at this a little bit from afar, although you obviously have a deep connection to the country. Uh, I called me out and I said, oh, we're going to Myanmar, Steve and Tom and I and, and Murray and, and Lindsay. And I said, one of the things you want to talk about is mill-to-mill -mill cooperation. And suddenly the phone got very quiet on the <laughs> other side. And I said, so uh, this is going to be a sensitive discussion, huh? Uh, what's clearly obvious is you have great leadership at the top of the Ministry of Health. But uh, you don't have to go too far down to find some big holes within the system in terms of capacity. The military obviously has got a much more substantial presence in the country. They command something like a third of the overall uh, national budget. So how do you see uh, the civilian side uh, as this new piece has come forward emerging uh, as a strong leader in health? And how do you see the interrelationship between the civilian and the military in addressing some of these urgent health challenges? Thank you, Dot. That's been the kind of tough question. You put you on the spot. I told you I was going to put you on the spot. Sure. Um, I think the military will always play an important role in Burma, whether we like it or not. Um, I want to be, I wanted to be in the military as a medical you know, personnel because that's how all the decisions are made by military when I was growing up in Burma. And so why do I have to just be a regular medical doctor when I cannot make decisions which will be imposed by military leaders. Why don't I be a military leader? Unfortunately, or fortunately, I was not allowed to be in the military. At the same time, trust of the military and civilian are severely, I kind of like, in the, you know the, the situation. Because um, in 1988, I was a young doctor. A military shot and killed thousands of people on the street. And then I do have friends in military. I would like to work with them, but at that time, there's no way we could do it. So now, taking a look at back 25 years, 
military is getting stronger. People, especially in ethnic regions, have more concerns about the military, because a lot of abuse is mentioned. But one thing I would like to mention is military, you cannot put a big stroke of brush. It's military. Not all military are the same. Because in military, there are some rank and files who are suffering the same as the civilians. Their top leaders may be gaining a lot of wealth and benefits. And so how do we really take a look at military? And I have been uh, listening to a lot of military issues. And military also needs to help. Our US military also needs to help how the Burmese military is helping its own personnel. In the border area, we saw some of the sex workers are from military families. And then so we cannot put military as everyone is the same. Getting back to now the leadership in the civilian military, it's a long history. And so confidence building is crucial. How do we build confidence? Military needs to talk with the civilians, not as a top down. And so if the US military can help Thai military, Cambodian, Vietnamese, if they can just really engage with the Burmese military, how Burmese military can be a part of a change. And they need to reform themselves for people to be confident in them. They need to show that they deserve the people's confidence and trust. If we can reach that part, we can move forward. I'm just talking about broader part because health is an, also an essential issue. When we were growing up, we did not have defense services medical school. Now they established. And they have very kind of a good structure, whereas other medical schools are suffering. And then so if US military is to engage with Burmese military in medical facility development issues. You also need to work together with the US government in terms of how do we really push forward human resources for help, health system strengthening, medical education, nursing education, lab management, everything that you are doing in military here, and you can help them. Back. But I would like to just get back to other questions because I will have a lot, of, a lot to say. Great. So uh, we're going to open it up in a sec. I just want to ask Mukesh one more question, which is uh, a number of speakers today, including our guests from Vietnam and Cambodia, have spoken about the importance of health system strengthening. Uh, when you talk to the folks at USAID, they understand that there's a lot of money flowing into the country on health, but it's PEPFAR money, it's Global Fund money, it's Gavi money. Those are all pretty focused uh, vertical sources of resources. The actual budget they have to deal with uh, stagnant water around the health facility uh, is pretty small. So as an institution, uh, World Bank has set forth a goal of working on health system strengthening. What do you see in terms of the future relationship, and how does it bear on some of these broader system challenges? And in some of your work in neighboring countries, is there a way for the World Bank to help broker some of the shared expertise that sits next to Myanmar and bring it in? Excellent question, Todd. Um, Working in health system strengthening is always a struggle because there is the short-term objective that the government has, that the ministry has, where they want to see a result immediately. Health system strengthening is not something that will give you an immediate result tomorrow. It is something that gives you a, a, a sustainable result day after tomorrow. So that always is a, is a big, big challenge to try and make sure that you have the right elements in place. As Todd pointed out, uh, we in the World Bank have uh, been focusing on health system strengthening. Um, we have a bunch of uh, people in the bank who are trained uh, economists, uh, particularly in health financing and health systems. And we work very closely with a large number of donors uh, like USAID, like uh, DFID, like AUSAID, uh, and so on, uh, like Global Fund, uh, in countries like Myanmar, taking their vertical programs in some instances, trying to influence them and their budgets and their allocations to make sure that a certain amount of money, maybe 5%, 10%, 12%, gets allocated to health system strengthening. 
and then working from within those vertical programs. Because if you get out of that vertical program and start doing something fancy, that's not going to work. It has to be something that shows a result as well. In Myanmar, we see three things that are extremely important. One, human resources. Um, we have a huge shortage of doctors, huge shortage of nurses. Uh, there are a very large number of townships. We have 330 townships in Myanmar. 110 townships we don't know much about in terms of human resource distribution. 220 townships, we have a slightly better sense. 68,000 villages, we have a good sense of about 35,000 of those villages. But a huge problem in terms of human resources, an essential element in any health system strengthening exercise. Infrastructure. We are not talking here about hospital buildings. Uh, we are not talking here about primary health care centers. We are talking about equipment and machinery and consumables and supplies that keep the thing running. Todd spoke about his experience where he went to this. We went to a primary health care center uh, very close uh, to Bagan, which is a beautiful drive from Napito to Bagan. And we went to a very fancy uh, health care center, which was shown to us by the government. And we went there, state-of-the-art equipment, state-of-the-art machinery, very nice uh, cold storage for vaccines, for medicines. Everything was completely empty. There was nothing there. Then there was a double lock system through which they opened their own medical supplies cabinet. So there were two persons who had to sign and open that big heavy steel door. So we thought we'll find something fancy behind that. And it was a sight that made us cry. Uh, we saw one bottle of paracetamol. Paracetamol is uh, like acetaminophen, an equivalent of that in most countries in Asia. One bottle of paracetamol, 60 pills for the entire catchment area of 85,000 people lying there. That was the total annual supply of paracetamol, which is a fever-reducing medicine for that entire catchment area. There's no doctor there on duty. There was no nurse even. There was one person who was kind of sort of trained. And he rightly said that I dare not even distribute this. I don't know whom to give it to. If I give it to one person, others would lynch me. My answer is I don't have anything at all. You guys go and buy from outside. Then this thing expires. Somebody will come and help me dispose it off. That is what we mean by that we need to get that kind of medical infrastructure in place. I'm actually very happy to say that we've been working very closely with the donors, and all of them are, are extremely cognizant of this. Uh, we are working very closely with the 3MDG fund that has set aside 11% of uh, uh, their allocation of 230 million US dollars, which is earmarked entirely to health system strengthening effort. Global fund has a huge chunk that is set aside. Gavi, a huge chunk that is set aside. Uh, with USAID, we've been working very closely with Bill and others in trying to figure out what are the right mechanisms of health system strengthening that we can, that we can bring into place. The third element of health system strengthening was financing. Now, we believe, or at least I believe, there is no shortage of money. I just told you that they quadrupled and increased the money sixfold. But we still don't know what to do with that money. We still don't have, don't have, a, have a formula, we don't have a mechanism or a thought process of how to take that thing around. And we believe that that is where the answer lies. And, uh, it is in Myanmar, there's a tremendous amount of cooperation amongst all uh, the donors and an interest in the government to get something going, which is why I said that, that I'm actually very optimistic. Thank you. May I just add, I Please. was thinking about this, I think there's similar things in the public health system and that there's an opportunity to not just invest in um, HIV or, or TB or whatever, but to really think about the surveillance and the laboratory um, capacities. If we could think about that up front strategically as a U.S. government and, and, and uh, invest in that in a, in a smart way, we could really help build a system that could, that could um, serve many diseases, not just the individual diseases that have funding right now. So I was going to get to a challenge that faces uh, both CDC and AID, and it actually faces uh, Global Fund and some of the others, which is the ability to invest in the government of Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Admiral Chin mentioned it in the last session, which is when, when do we know? Uh, when do we know when this is actually going to take hold uh, and we can actually start investing in the government? How do we convince the political people who are appropriately reticent about jumping the gun uh, when it's time for us to turn the tide and, and, and try to invest in the government? The Global Fund money goes through Save the Children UK and through UN Ops. 
Uh, Gavi's money goes through intermediaries. Most of it goes through UNICEF to buy vaccines and distribute it. So the actual capacity building money, the ability to invest in the government systems to start to build that up, uh, when do we know that it's time to start doing that? Uh, Miat. Right. <laughs> time is now. And then it has been, it, time has been again a long time ago. And then when we talk about health system strengthening, and what I take a look at it is in five areas. Because status of Burma, you know, Myanmar's health system right now is, if I have to say a few words, is struggling, challenging, and promising. It's struggling because they have been major limitation in investment for decades. And the demands and the need for health, you know, the kind of the challenges are huge. Mm. So the system is struggling. It has been struggling for a long time. It's challenging because now everyone gets talking about investment is going to, uh, coming in, a lot of uh, countries are coming over. But when we talk about increase of the budget, if I may say so, is although they increase the budget in charts, this is Burmese currency, Burmese currency. The previously three years ago, the exchange rate was about 10 jets per dollar. And then now, it is 800 jets per dollar. So although they increased the absolute number of budget, the purchasing power, especially for the, the one, this is if I understand it correctly, your banks, you know better than I do. And I, I studied uh, one, uh, <laughs> the economics too, but this is the one that I was told by the minister. And Although budget has increased, I cannot purchase as much as I want. And then so this is one area of challenge that we need to take a look at it is how do we go through this. But promising, as it's, you know, all of you put in the, the, uh, your book, people are extremely excited. And I was not able to go back for many years. And last five years when I got back, and especially the last two, and Excitement is palpable in the street. And then so people are so kind of like, you know, kind of like interested in working with everyone outside, as well as inside, so it's promising. But we tend to forget that what are the key areas? The people. We strengthen systems to serve people. And then so people of Burma is, as you all know, very diverse, geographically, ethnically, language, and so how do we really provide services? When we talk about services, we talk services about curative treatment and care. Preventive services, rehabilitative services, promotive services, these are the services that they need to move forward. And so for these services, who are going to provide? And providers come in, number three, providers. Providers, traditional providers, non-traditional providers. As some of you have mentioned, especially with malaria, in Burma, when I was growing up, there's Koyazai. It's kind of Beatles in the shop. This is where you can buy medicine. You don't need to do anything. So I thought it was gone. But when I got back here to Burma two, two years ago, and it kept just in just July also, and my, one of my friends told me that you can just go and get and ask for a mixer. Some, of the kind of, some people get sick, and they, don't, they cannot afford to go to the, the doctor. They will go to a little kind of shop and ask, oh, I'm, I have a headache, I have a fever, can you give me something? They will mix things up. And so this kind of provider, we need to just be aware of it. And the traditional you know, providers, such as doctors, nurses, you know, the other ones, and together with you know, other military. Military can serve some of the services too. So these are the providers. But whatever they do, they need to have a structure. The structure, as you mentioned, about financing, regulation, and that we don't know what drugs are coming from. And when I was you know, a young doctor, and I, was, I would like to just you know, kind of make sure that all the, you can, I was at the teaching hospital teaching, I mean, kind of like giving uh, treatments. But medicine that we got, as you mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, is that it is, has to be in the kind of like uh, cupboard. But they are always locked for very important persons. So the point for that is, when we have to just get medicine from China, Thailand, and other places, we don't know the quality of it. So these are the areas we need to just change. But now is support. Support coming from, not only just from international, national, 
local. Right now, people, Burmese people are addressing themselves. Some people are pulling their own money, and I had a chance to travel a lot of places where my friends are, and they are pulling their own money with the community money and having uh, free clinic services, and, but all the good things that they are doing, it's just, you know, tiny compared to the needs. And so if we want to just really rehabilitate Burma's health system, and with the people inside, especially in ethnic areas, working together with them, and also international agencies, coordination, coordination, coordination. And how do we do that? If we can do that well, together with the regional partners, and I think we will see Burma the way that we can help. So a place of, of huge opportunity and a place of huge challenge. So I, I wanna open it up for questions. I know if you're sitting there and you're looking at this from the FDA or Michael from the WHO, uh, if you turn around and you look north, you see India and China, uh, two manufacturers of a lot of the good drugs and two manufacturers of a lot of the bad drugs. So uh, how do you deal with the challenges that Myanmar faces with three billion people sitting on its border that uh, are potentially offering things that are helpful and not helpful uh, in a very challenging environment? Um, it, Alan, when you're talking about addressing Artemis and resistant malaria, it's certainly uh, the epicenter in some ways has been always identified as Cambodia, but Cambodia is on top of it. Myanmar is still quite behind. So what are we going to do specifically with a very weak health system uh, and a military that's still using and producing monotherapy artemisinin? What is it we're going to do that's going to get on top of this with the kind of urgency that was discussed uh, this morning? So I'm, I would love for people to probe and poke at this a little bit. Uh, there are some microphones out there, um, hands over here, and then uh, Admiral Collison gets a, a chance. Uh, Lou Mazel, Department of State. I spent a couple of days in Glen Eagles Hospital in Singapore, and I would estimate that about a third of the nursing staff were Burmese. So I guess the question is, how do you prevent this loss of health professionals to countries such as Singapore and perhaps as well to the, to the Middle East where a lot of nurses go as well? Let me re-ask the question we were asking the last, in the last session. That has to do with the, the parts of uh, Myanmar that are controlled by other than the government, where there's been ceasefires in Shan State and Kachin, which have their own health system there. If the U.S. says the time is now and supports the Myanmar military or the Myanmar government, is that a risk of alienating the people who recently signed a ceasefire with that government? You want to take those? There's somebody behind. There's one more over here. I, yeah, I want to find out what you're going to write about when the U.S. actually starts to fund and Colin Chin pulls the, the lever and more money flows to help in the mill mill conversation. I'll send you the health. link. So Again, you can tell us what your article is going to say. <laughs> Again, I'm Fung Tran with the U.N. Crisis Newswire. We're independent of the U.N., but we're founded by them. My question is for Katie and, and just in general about uh, donors reengaging. Is your timetable for for a project approval and disbursements any different than any other country. I just spoke to JICA there, and they're giving out $912 million by the end of the year. Um, the person in charge of health and social services says she's literally up at night trying to figure out how to spend down her money. She said that her project approval process has been condensed from a year to six months, and so I asked her what about donor accountability. She also talked about the problems of finding partners to implement because of the human resource issues. I'm wondering how you will address those challenges. Great. So those are three great questions. Um, let's go. Go. Katie, go ahead. Since, um, I'll answer that, the last question first. And um, unfortunately, no, we don't have a special allowance for a truncated timetable in Burma. Um, however, we have had existing programs there. We've actually been working in the country since 2003 in the health sector. And we have existing mechanisms that we're able to put money into rather than having these pro full open procurements that, that take a long time. <laughs> you know, we hear a lot about how long we take to program funding. So for right now, um, we're, we're in good shape and we're able to move somewhat quickly. And also we're putting money into the 3MDG fund, which you know, is going on there. And that, that gets us leveraging work with other donors in the country too. Um, going forward, we're getting ready to, to look what is the next phase of our portfolio there. And um, we're starting early to plan out years of funding so that we hopefully don't have any gaps in our programming or end up with backed up pipeline, like you're saying. Um, and the mill mill engagement. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I, we, we continue to talk about this within the agency and I think the rest of the USG, we realize um, the, the power that the military has in Burma. Um, certainly we're not there yet and I think it'll take a lot of action on the Hill before we can get there. Um, but we also would be foolish not to be thinking about what, what power they have um, you know, within the Ministry of Health and, and within the states. Um, fortunately, we have been able to engage with our supply chain strengthening um, activity. We are engaging with governments um, in all of the states. So um, we had senior MIH officials from, from every state at the launch of the activity. Um, over 120 officials there, so we are engaging across the country. Thanks, Mukesha. An issue you've addressed in many countries, the flow of healthcare workers. That's a difficult one. We don't have a good handle at this point of time on how many trained, trained medical, trained and skilled medical staff uh, have crossed the border and are working elsewhere. We do know that salaries in Myanmar, at least two years back, were extremely low in the public sector. And uh, the government has uh, taken a deliberate measure to start increasing the salary. So a great deal of that uh, increase of the budget, not a great deal, but a good proportion of that, actually went to fund increased salaries. In the last year, again, they have pledged a further increase of salaries of 23% in the entire public sector across the board. But even then, the total wage bill in Myanmar in the health sector remains very, very low. You'll be surprised, 22%, that is it that goes to salaries. Overall in the public sector across the entire government, for the entire government spending, the amount of money that goes to salaries, 11%. So it is still extremely depressed. So until such time as the salaries don't rise, some of this movement, subject to all sorts of other conditions of movement, will continue in any free market environment. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, we don't have a good handle on the salience, but we do believe that once the economy starts picking up and there is a deliberate increase in uh, public sector salaries, uh, private sector just now, which is concentrated in three big towns, uh, starts expanding and grows out of uh, the not-for-profit uh, sector, we think that things will change a lot. And we have seen that in many other countries around the uh, uh, region. And I don't think that Myanmar will be any exception. But you are right, at this point it's a concern. If I may address that question, it is kind of a why people are outside. It's a kind of a every con developing country is facing the challenge in Africa, in the other Asian country as well. And so it is push and pull. And so it is, salary is very important. And then also, more important than salary is recognition and security and career development. Mm -hmm. And so when a young woman who is posted to a remote country area and who doesn't have the security for her personal security, she will not be able to go. At the same time, when she has a chance to move to another place, she would. And then also, another thing is training. That's why when we're talking about health system strength and human resources for health, it's quantity, quality, and retention. And then so once you really feel that you, know, that you are recognized, you are appreciated, and you are supported. And then when I am in the hospital, and if I don't have the medicine that I'm supposed to be providing, if I don't have the instruments I need to be operating, why do I have to stay? And so that question is a very loaded question and extremely important, and I hope that international communities, like you know, all of you are walking through the different systems, can really provide some form of uh, assistance. On top of it, and the medical professional would like to be linked with the international community. And the research, evidence-based interventions, when they are engaged in that, although they may not have an, you know, kind of a lot of financial rewards, they may want to stay. Mm -hmm. Just quickly about um, one other thing about salary. I, I would like to just mention about the physicians. My friends, who were trained in England, get their you know, FRCP, MRCP, and then go back home. And they have to work very long hours at, in the kind of hospital, they have to teach, and they, did the, they are doing their practice until one or two in the morning. 
because the consultation fees is 3,000 to 5,000 chats, which is $5 per person. And then expenses are getting larger because they have kids, they would like to send abroad. So they have to see about 100 patients a day to make the ends meet. And so when that kind of a situation is there, it is very difficult for them. And then, so I'm not saying that I mean, kind of a, this is a, to defend them or anything. Like this is the situation. We need to look at the situation as it is, and we need to address as practically as possible rather than theoretical and academic exercise. So we have a question over here, and while the microphone's getting over there, Patty, um, as Mukesh said, uh, the money shows that a significant part of health is delivered outside of the public system. Uh, we don't exactly know what's going on with the military, most of it serving members and their families and maybe some civilians. But one of the challenges that a lot of your interactions are government to government, while significant capacity exists outside the government. So how do you in, in, in engage in your capacity building when a lot of the current capacity sits outside the public sector? Um, very carefully. <laughs> so uh, I, I think um, one thing I wanted to mention is that we're working with uh, PMI to um, sponsor two, um, two physicians from Myanmar to the Thai, Thailand FETP, Field Epidemiology Training Program. So, um, and what we know from, from those, our experience in other countries is that um, the things that were mentioned earlier, that you need um, uh, people to, to stay in the, if they're gonna stay in the, health system, the public health system, they need to have a career track, they need to be valued. So uh, this is a very first step and a very um, small baby step, but some, um, something that we hope will help build that capacity. The other thing is that um, in other countries that have a lot of challenges with, um, um, with direct funding, we just start small and we provide a lot, of, um, a lot of technical assistance, not just in the technical areas, but also on the management of the actual agreement and, and how you do reports and you know, that sort of thing. So I think starting small and building up that capacity over time is the only way I'd have to go forward. Great. I don't know where the microphones are. There was somebody over here at the head and stuff. There yes. you go. Hi, I'm uh, Anupama Tantri with the Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Uh, I actually just returned from a trip to Myanmar where we were looking at uh, some of the challenges as well as the progress that the national program to address lymphatic filariasis and other neglected tropical diseases um, is having. And I was having some discussions with many of the partners. And one of the things that I know is coming up is the issue of decentralization mm -hmm. across the government. And I just had two quick questions. One is, what does that mean for priorities uh, for public health and the health system? And, and as a country is looking to decentralize, I know the 3MDG fund focuses on township level. And what does that mean for um, how the capacity is going to be built across all levels of government? And then my second question was specifically related to ASEAN and with Myanmar taking on the chairmanship of uh, ASEAN in 2014, what does that mean for both regional priorities and, and the opportunities that are there to strengthen some of those issues like malaria um, and other issues um, both within, us, uh, within Myanmar um, as being the chair and being the leader on some of these health issues across the region? Mukesh, uh, help us a little bit with ASEAN, and, and Mia, you want to come in, and maybe while you're at the tail end of that, you can tell us a little bit about where Asia Development Bank's going. I know there's an affiliation and not a direct connection, but somebody mentioned earlier today that ADB is looking to get more into health, and Myanmar is one of the starting places, so uh, if you could help us with that. So ASEAN, um, so as is typical, and this we see across the world in all of these kinds of forums, when a country takes on um, the presidency of these kinds of um, bodies, um, clearly there is this great desire to, to demonstrate and to show something and to, to show some big achievement. So in Myanmar, there was the, the IMF uh, uh, Article 4 mission, which, which happened a few months back. And in those discussions, uh, the government very categorically stated that uh, the focus that they have in the year to come is on preventive care. I think that was a point which was mentioned by Mia. Uh, at this point of time, they spend only around, what, 9% of total amount of money on preventive care. So they want to spend on preventive care, on maternal child health, and, on, and they want to strengthen primary care. So the amount of money that they're spending on uh, building new hospitals or rehabilitating 
old hospitals is going to be dramatically reduced and uh, bulk of uh, this money is going into maternal child health uh, because that is one MDG including uh, that of infant mortality which they will not be able to meet by 2015 for sure. Uh, and that is something that is preoccupying their thinking at this point of time. Will this, get, will this get affected by any talk of decentralization? We don't believe so. We don't believe that decentralization is going to change any of the priorities. We don't even believe that it is going to change the ownership and management of uh, health functions, at least for a few more years to come. We believe that it will continue to stay within the purview I mean, after all, keep in mind that uh, the public sector in the public domain of the Ministry of Health controls only a small part of uh, the entire machinery of health. So it will continue to stay within that domain at least for some more time to come in the foreseeable future. Mia, yeah, you want to come in? Um, Burma is, you know, neglected like tropical diseases, there are plenty of them. <laughs> and then so there are a lot to address. And so I will be happy to talk with you later about that. But more importantly, that is, other non-communicable diseases, road traffic injuries are mm -hmm. huge. And this address has been very limited. Tobacco use and cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, is increasing. And they are not well prepared to address it. And also, the other one is gender. And then kind of like a you know, woman's health issue. And it's when we talk about neglected areas, so much Burma needs to address, and that's why we can assist in many ways. Quickly, just want to mention the, um, to, the, uh, to uh, Admiral's uh, question before. It's like, if you engage with the Burmese military, would it offend the ethnic minority areas? It depends. Because ethnic minority areas, although I mean, there are ceasefires has been, uh, been kind of like established, and there are some uh, paramilitary in those areas, in the Shan, Kachins, and they're still working on that. And then so you will need to just work together with the civilian arms of those ethnic groups. And then again, it's confidence building will be important to, to establish. So it can be done with mill mill, mill to mill, but at the same time, a country like China, uh, Thailand and Vietnam can really help you in assisting and talking with ethnic group because I, a lot of ethnic group uh, leaders have uh, reached out to different health approaches, including another kind of training of their own people. And I have trained many of them when I was in, uh, in the Thai Burma border area. And so I think it, everything has had to be very cautiously, like Betty mentioned, cautiously approached. But I think it should not stop you from reaching out to ethnic groups, and then, but you need to get uh, concurrence from the Burmese military. So Katie, one of the things that you've been doing since 2003 is actually working with some of the ethnic groups. There is some discussion, although a little disjointed, around a federated model. Uh, depends uh, who you question and what that looks like. But one of the capacities that does exist is that some of these uh, independent or volatile areas has built its own health capacity, in some cases looking to build their own departments and ministries of health. Uh, so. How do you continue to support and build and, and, and leverage that capacity while working uh, in Napidao and Yangon with uh, the Myanmar government? How do you, you work sort of at both levels? Well, I think this gets back, gets back to the importance of um, really working in a collaborative way with the other donors in the country and with the government and whether it's the national government or the state or township governments because um, Certainly, we can't be everywhere. Um, we have two full-time <laughs> chief staff. So, um, and with a decentralized model, that changes things also. And so, really, um, once we have a unified health strategy, which we still don't have, um, and having this dialogue, we can figure out what approaches are needed most where, and how we can best work together. Great, last round of questions. Just one over here in the back with a microphone, sorry. Hold on, we already got a microphone. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, Dan McBrayer, NIH National Cancer Institute. Um, we've already heard one of the distinguished uh, panelists bring up the importance of, of tackling NCDs in, uh, in Burma. And 
I'm curious as to what the prospects are for engaging Burma on NCDs in the near future, especially considering um, those which overlap with infectious disease, for example, um, cervical cancer and HPV. Great. There was a question over here. Hi, I'm Alana Yaretsky. I'm from GW, from the Department of Global Health. Um, I'm, I'm an anthropologist of China, so I think about this from the, from the Chinese side. Uh, and, you know, it's clear that China feels as if we have enacted some sort of containment policy since we've increased our engagement with, with, with Burma. And so I'm wondering, you know, as you think about a mill-to-mill -mill engagement, right, how, do, how, do, how do you start to negotiate that with our... Um, with, with our relationship with, with China. Um, and even beyond that, if you think about the health concerns, the really serious health concerns in the ethnic states, like the Kachin state, um, you know, how do, we, how do we start to approach that, right? Because then you're getting closer to China. Um, so that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is, how, how, how concerned is the Burmese government about these things? Well, Admiral Chin's in the back of the room. You should have given him that question in the last one. Maybe if he wants to take the microphone, since he noted that his top priority is spending time in China, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, giving us a quick answer, how, how do you deal with that when you're engaging with the Chinese and they're looking south across their border and they're clearly dealing with one of the troubled ethnic states? Uh, how are you managing this, this dialogue, uh, both directly with China and also through your emerging contacts with Myanmar? Yeah, I'm going to answer that a couple ways. Um, if you take it from the Chinese perspective, if they look at a map and you flip that map over and then they see where the U.S. has uh, bases and stuff, from their perspective, they think, you know, they're, they're, we're containing them. Uh, Admiral Locklear's perspective, and he's the U.S. Pacific Command commander, is that, and, and many of us, is uh, the U.S. is, 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 a, is an Asia-Pacific nation. We've always been an Asia-Pacific nation. And um, the center of gravity for the world is shifting towards the, the Asia, towards Asia, in terms of population, in terms of economics. And so, as, as the president has said, we're a, Pacific, we're a Pacific nation, and so therefore we will be engaged in the Asia-Pacific region. And, and U.S. military uh, is doing as, as the president said, because it's not just the DOD thing, this is, again, the entire United States uh, policy is, is to, uh, to uh, come to the Pacific. So from my perspective, uh, what, as, as we engage with China, um, again, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I focus on, on, the, on the health-related issues. Uh, we're, we're working, as I, as I mentioned, on, on disaster relief, uh, humanitarian assistance, and, and my, my vision for that, because we have, uh, so the Chinese have a hospital ship, it's called the Peace Ark. We have the Mercy and the Comfort. Um, we have done photo ops on both ships. My predecessor was in, in, in Brunei uh, and, and visited the ship. We have taken their uh, Surgeon General to our ship. But uh, China has been invited to the largest naval exercise in the world, which is called RIMPAC, in 2014 and they're gonna be actual um, players and, and not just observers. And they're planning to bring, uh, I mean, we're hearing that they're thinking about bringing uh, the Peace Ark to RIMPAC. So I think that's a wonderful opportunity for us to take the next step in terms of health engagements with China is to have our doctors, our nurses, get a team on, on board their, their ship. Likewise, they can come to our ships. And then we work, because it's all about, uh, it's a, a disaster relief exercise that we work together and, and, and figure out how we can work together. So the next typhoon, the next tsunami, that's gonna, as I mentioned, that's gonna occur if both hospital ships arrive, that we, both US and China, we work together. I think that would be a huge stabilizing uh, uh, optic for that region because most of these nations do not want to choose sides. They would like to see the US and China working together. So that, that's my perspective, and, and how, that's my vision that I want to see our, our engagements in, with China for that goal. Thank you, Admiral. 
Uh, it is important to note that China has in the past been very focused on helping. Uh, so I know the Global Fund provided uh, China with money in 2010 to help deal with artemisinin resistance along the border area. Uh, Thailand has also stepped forward and the, some of the other countries have stepped forward here. Uh, China is also the manufacturer of the active ingredient in ACTs. Uh, so they, you know, they have a very strong uh, and important uh, drug manufacturing industry. So they're, uh, at least in some places, interested in trying to address the manufacturers of the substandard drugs, which are also coming from China and from India. So uh, like a lot of places, the situation is complex. Uh, quick comments, lightning comments from the panel, because we're out of time, but it would be great to get a final bit. Uh, how do we uh, know that we've succeeded, and how long do you think it's going to take before this stabilizes? There's a lot of discussions around 2015, but one of the points that we made in our paper is that there's still a lot of turbulence ahead. So what do we expect in the near term and the medium term? Let's go down. Mukesh. How will we know that we have succeeded? You know, President Jim Kim has thrown a big challenge to all of us, which is to eradicate poverty and uh, to ensure that everything that we do leads to shared prosperity. 26% of people in Myanmar live in extreme poverty. 60% of them seek care when they are ill compared to 96% of the people who are rich who seek care when they are ill. As far as we are concerned, if we can increase that number of people who seek care from 60% to 96%, then we will know that we have succeeded. Will we get there? We think so, yes. It won't be easy, and it won't happen tomorrow. There are a very large number of challenges. There are challenges within the health system. There are challenges within the government system. There are challenges within the society. There are challenges within the country. There are all sorts of political challenges. There are border area challenges. There are challenges across different uh, townships. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But we are extremely optimistic that, I think Mia made this point, that if you, if you, if you go to Myanmar just now, now, we have been there maybe four or five times. Between the first time, which was last year, and the fourth time, which was this year, you see a palpable difference. You see a hope. You see the excitement. You see that dynamism. And we believe it is that dynamism of the people that is going to make this whole, whole, whole program succeed. Governments are fantastic in enabling things, but it is the people who have to make things happen. And we are seeing that change already. So we are very optimistic. It, I, I won't be able to put a timeline to it, but uh, definitely very, very soon. I would say that you would see a very big difference in the next five years. And uh, then, of course, there will be newer challenges which will come forward. I want to very quickly respond to the question from there about NCDs. That is there, a, is there any appetite in the government to address and think about NCDs? Of course, yes. Can you engage with them? Of course, yes. Can they do anything about it? Perhaps not. Because the, the range, the, the scope, and the control that they have at this point of time is, is uh, quite minimal. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Global Burden of Disease uh, study that came out a few years back uh, rates uh, one out of five of the top killers is NCDs. So the four of them still are in, in the domain of communicable diseases. And that is something that preoccupies the government. Not to say that they shouldn't be doing NCDs, but just to say that the preoccupation at this point of time is elsewhere. Thank you. Great. I'll echo things that are moving very fast. Turn off the mic. We've seen a lot of change just in the past couple of years. Our access to facilities to see our sites where our project work is being done has increased incredibly, as has our engagement with the Ministry of Health. Um, we are looking at 2015, and we are cautiously optimistic that there will be um, you know, good, fair elections. And that national reconciliation process is really key to Burma's overall development, but also health outcomes, because you need the people to have trust in the government and the health care that the government is going to provide and to feel engaged um, in their communities. Um, you know, it's hard to say what, what is success. I mean, like the World Bank, we have a goal of ending extreme poverty within a generation and ending preventable maternal child deaths in a generation, so very ambitious global goals. Um, I think Burma will move fast along that. There, even access to mobile technologies is going fast. Information is going to be in people's hands quicker and um, more um, accurately than ever before. So um, I don't know what, what 
success will look <coughs> like in five or ten years, but I think we'll see um, definite progress. We'll have one DHS next year, and I think we'll see huge improvements when there's another one in five years. And I think one big benchmark of success will be seeing those management of the Global Fund grants transition away from UNOPS and Save the Children back to the Ministry of Health. Amen. And mm -hmm. that'll be a huge marker of success. Patty. Um, so uh, success isn't a yes or no answer, so it's, uh, I think... We don't have time for subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say we're just really getting started in that um, in, in other situations where we've had um, a long way to go, like this one, um, you start out with little baby steps and you don't really think that you're getting very far, but then in no time you look back and see you've actually come a long way, so we look forward to doing that. Great. Mia, I know you've got a lot to say, but give us a short answer. One of the indicators of success is when we don't have to have a meeting like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so that way we can just learn from the success and share it, that will be the success. And then what we need to keep on doing is we need to just put our organizations, countries, missions, head aside and look at the people inside. What do we need to help them out? What do they want? Not that what we want them to do. It is what they want us to be helping them. Help them, crystallize it, clear it, and work together with them. Country ownership is the sustainability. Country ownership, without country ownership, we cannot move forward. At the same time, country with 135 language and different ethnic groups, it will be a challenge. And for me, it'll be my lifetime, and I don't think I will see the country that I wanted to see till I die, because it is a continuing process, ongoing process. If we think that we can stop, it is wrong. We need to keep working on it. Great, so to be continued. Uh, let's thank the panelists. <laughs> Professor Morrison, final words. Um, this has been an ex really quite an extraordinary day. I want to do two things. One is uh, thank a few of the folks who who really put uh, an enormous amount of effort to make this happen. And then I want to just summarize in one minute what I think I heard. Um, first of all, uh, Lindsay Hammergren, uh, kudos for a really an extraordinary effort. Uh, many uh, junior staff and interns uh, put in many hours for this. Amy Shipow, Xuan Zhu, uh, Mary Muller, Ann Anderson, Jessica Alpert. Carolyn Schrode, of course, uh, the mayor of CSIS, uh, remains very uh, engaged in, in helping pull everything together here. Um, and um, uh, our partner, Murray he uh, Hebert, from the Southeast Asia program, a close friend and ally and great guide for this. What, I come away uh, with a couple of very strong impressions. There seems to be a, uh, a deep consensus across all of these speakers that health is very fundamental to the stability and, and the security and the growth uh, of this region, of Mekong, looking forward into the future. There seems to have been a sea change uh, attitudinally across uh, different sectors and across uh, different agencies and governments, those within the region, those like ourselves. There's an enormous amount of energy and hope and optimism. And there's a, there's a, there's a very deep commitment, I think, to, to finding new forms of engagement there seems to be this notion that U.S. government agencies, the widening, there's a widening array of interest among U.S. agencies. Uh, FDA, DOD, as, as, as partners that no, might normally not be on a, a program like this, along with those stalwart agencies that have such a deep footprint within the region, like CDC and USAID and others in NIH. There's a lot of regional capacity. Uh, there's a lot of humility that I heard also, particularly from some of the U.S. agency uh, folks in terms of admitting that our role is a supportive and a technical support role in many, in many cases, but we have to be there. We have to be there at the table and figure out how we are going to restructure our relationships in the most, uh, in the most productive way uh, soon. Uh, there is this strong ethic, I think, that is guiding this. There's an ethic that comes across many of these. Uh, Dr. Hien, Dr. Orr, you've made a very extraordinary effort to be with us today. We're very honored and grateful, and I hope we can remain. I know we will remain in close touch. So please join me in thanking them and all of you for coming today.